Carnegie Hall in New York City, the home of the world's greatest musical events. Today's event is one in a series of New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein. And here is Mr. Bernstein. Give me that spray. Behind the spray. Oh, there's no time? No time? Now, what do you think that music's all about? Can you tell me? God. That's just what I thought you'd say. Cowboys, bandits, horses, the Wild West. I know my little daughter, Jamie, who's five years old and who's sitting up there, agrees with you. When she heard me play this piece, she said, Ooh, the Lone Ranger saw. I owe silver. Well, I hate to disappoint her, and you too. But it really isn't about the Lone Ranger at all. It's about notes, E flats and F sharps. You see, no matter how many times people tell you stories about what music means, forget them. Stories aren't what music means about, at all. Music is never about anything. Music just is. Music is notes, beautiful notes and sounds put together in such a way that we get pleasure out of listening to them. That's all there is to it. And when we ask, what does it mean? What does this piece of music mean? Then we're asking a very hard question. And that's the question we're going to try to answer today. Now, it's a funny thing about this meaning business, in music anyway. When you say, what does it mean? What you're really saying is, what is it trying to tell me? What ideas? does it make me have? Just like words. When you hear words, you get ideas from them. If I say to you, oh, I burned my finger, then immediately you get an idea from what I said, or some ideas. You get the idea that I burned my finger, that it hurts, that I might not be able to play the piano anymore, or that I have a loud, ugly voice when I scream. Lots of different ideas like that. That's words. But if I play you notes, just notes on the piano like that. Those notes don't tell you any ideas. Those notes aren't about burning your finger or Sputniks or lampshades or rockets or anything. Well, what are they about? They're about music. For instance, take this piece by Chopin. Beautiful, isn't it? But what's it about? Nothing. Or take this Beethoven sonata. That's not about anything either. Or take this piece of boogie woogie. It's not about anything either. They're none of them about anything but they're all fun to listen to. Now, why should they be fun to listen to? I don't know, it's just part of human nature to like to listen to music. 
You see, notes aren't like words at all. Because if I say one single word all by itself to you, like rocket, immediately you have an idea. You see a picture in your mind. Rocket, bang, picture. But if I play a note, one note all alone, that means nothing. It's just a plain old F sharp or a B flat. A sound, that's all, higher or lower, louder or softer. A sound that can seem very different if I play it or if I sing it or if an oboe plays it or if a xylophone plays it or if a trombone plays it. Very different. It's all the same note, only with a different sound. Now, all music is, is a combination of sounds like that one and that one and that one and that one, all put together according to a plan. And the guy who plans it is called the composer, whether he's named Richard Rogers or Rimsky Korsakov. He's the composer. And his plan is to put the sounds together with rhythms and different instruments and voices or whatever in such a way that what finally comes out is exciting or fun or touching or interesting or all of those together. That's called music and it has a musical meaning which has nothing to do with any stories or pictures or anything like that. Of course, if there is a story connected to the music, okay. Sometimes it's good. In a way, it could give an extra meaning to the music, but it's extra. Remember that. And so, whatever music means, it's not the story. Well, what does it mean? That's what we're going to find out. Now, let's take the first step to finding out. Remember the piece we played at the beginning? That Wild West piece of music. Well, for one thing, it can't mean the Wild West for the simple reason that it was written by a fellow who never heard of the Wild West an Italian named Rossini. Now, we think his music means cowboys and horses and the Wild West because we've been told so by so many movies and television shows. But Rossini really wrote this piece as an overture to an opera called William Tell, which is about people in Switzerland, which is pretty far from the Wild West. Well then, maybe the music's supposed to be about William Tell and Switzerland instead of about cowboys. Is that what it's about? No, it's not about William Tell or cowboys or lampshades or rockets or anything. Then what makes it so exciting? Well, there are a million reasons. But they're all musical reasons. That's the main point. For instance, take the rhythm, which is like the rhythm of galloping horses or like the rhythm of drums in a battle. But that doesn't mean that the music is about drums or horses or battles. The meaning is only the excitement of that rhythm, you see? Now, another reason it's exciting is that it has a mighty fine tune, one that's easy to remember and stirs your blood. It starts with a phrase going up, and answers itself with a phrase going down. It's like a question and answer. Or maybe it's more like an argument with the second person winning it. Uh, let's ha try and have that argument, you and me, and see who wins. I'm going to sing the first phrase, and you're going to argue back with the second phrase, and I'm going to argue back again with the third phrase, and you're going to wind it up with the fourth phrase. Okay, ready, go. You win. You see? You see how exciting that last phrase is? It has all the excitement and triumph of winning an argument. It makes you feel good. But there are still more reasons why this music is exciting. For instance, the way it's played, the instruments that play it, like those trumpets at the beginning. Or the violin who use their bows in a jumping way to make that galloping sound. Would you show us, Mr. Corigliano? You see? Now, when all the strings do that together, it really gallops. Watch. It's 
So you see, this music is exciting because it was written to be exciting, for musical reasons and for no other reasons. Well, if all that's true, then why does a composer put names on his music at all? Why doesn't he just write something called symphony or trio or composition number 95012 or anything? Why does he give his music a name like the Sorcerer's Apprentice or whatever it happens to be if it's not important to the music? Well, every once in a while, an artist is stimulated to express himself by something outside himself, something he reads or something he sees or something that's happened to him. Haven't you ever felt like that, that you wanted to dance or sing because something happened to you that made you want to dance or sing and express your feelings in some way? I'm, I'm sure that you've all had that feeling. Well, it's the same with a composer. For instance, Johann Strauss wrote an awful lot of waltzes. And one of them goes like this. You know the name of this one? Right, the Blue Danube. Now, maybe the Danube River inspired Strauss to write that waltz. I don't know, I have my doubts. But in any case, those notes don't have anything to do with the Danube River, do they? Now, what's this one? What? Right, Tales of the Vienna Woods. Well, why couldn't that one be called by the Blue Danube? Or the Emperor Waltz? or the Tennessee Waltz, or the Missouri Waltz, for that matter. What's the difference? A Strauss Waltz by any other name is still just a lovely waltz. The name doesn't matter, except to help you take, tell one waltz apart from another, and maybe give the music a little more color, like a sort of fancy dress costume. But now I'm going to try a trick with you. We're going to play you a piece that has a story, a very good story, but I'm going to tell you the wrong story. I'm just going to make one up out of my head that doesn't belong to this music at all. And I'm not going to tell you the real name of this piece. And you see if the story and the music don't go together just as well as if it were the real story. Okay, here goes. In the middle of a big city, there stands an enormous jail full of prisoners. It's midnight and all the prisoners are asleep except for one who can't sleep because he was put in jail unjustly. And he spends the whole night practicing on his kazoo while all the other prisoners are sleeping and snoring all around him. You all know what a kazoo is. You? Well, this kazoo playing prisoner has a friend who's going to come and rescue him tonight. And this friend's name is Superman. So, Superman comes charging down through the alley on his motorcycle. <laughs> then he whistles his secret whistle so that his friend, the prisoner, will know he's coming. <laughs> now, as he gets nearer the prison, he hears all the prisoners snoring away peacefully in the dead silence of the night. And over this snoring, he hears his friend playing on his kazoo, which gets louder and louder as he gets nearer. <laughs> Suddenly, he charges into the prison yard and bops the guard over the head. <clears throat> Kazoo stops playing, and with all the snoring still going on, he grabs his friend and whisks him away on his motorcycle. <laughs> the snoring gets farther and farther away until we don't hear it at all anymore. <laughs> and our hero arrives at last to freedom. <laughs> That's
that's the story. Now, let's hear how this music sounds all put together. And remember to keep this story in your mind. Here goes. Here comes Superman. He hears the whistle. There goes the snoring. the kazoo. And now here comes Superman. <coughs> Pop! <coughs> Grab his friend. And they're off. Snoring gets softer. They're free! Now, all that makes good sense, doesn't it? Makes perfectly good sense. But that's not the real story at all. What this piece really is, is part of a much longer piece by Richard Strauss called Don Quixote. And in it, Strauss was trying to tell a whole other story, which goes something like this. Don Quixote is the name of a silly old man back in the days of knights in armor and horseback, a foolish old man who read too many books about knighthood and chivalry and conquering armies for his beautiful lady and all that sort of nonsense, and who finally decided he was a marvelous knight himself. So off he goes on his skinny, bony old horse to conquer the world. And he has with him a companion named Sancho Panza, a little fat, jolly fellow who is very faithful to his master but it was also sensible enough to know that his master's a little cuckoo. So we hear him laughing at old Don Quixote. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, Don Quixote spies a flock of sheep in the middle of a field going ba. That's all that stuff you heard before which we thought was snoring. And with them is a shepherd keeping the sheep and playing on his pipe the way all shepherds do. Not a kazoo, but a shepherd's pipe. And Don Quixote, in his mixed up mind, thinks that the sheep are an army, specially put there for him to conquer. So in he charges with his sword flashing. And the sheep run off in all directions, bawling wildly. And he's convinced he has done a truly knightly deed. And is he proud? Now, let's listen to it all over again with the real story in mind and see how it sounds.
Now, was that music any different from what we played before? Was it? Is it more exciting or more fun or better music? No. Does it have any different musical meaning? No. It's exactly the same. Only the story is different. And in fact, there are a hundred other stories I could have made up out of my head for the same piece of music. But the music would still have been just as good or just as bad as it is without any story at all. Now do you see what I mean? Well, if you don't, then I'm going to have to try again. I'll take another little bit of this Don Quixote piece of Strauss. Later in that same piece, there's another part about another adventure the old fellow has when he and his friend Sancho Panza take a wild ride through the air on a wooden horse. It goes like this. <clears throat> Now, in this part, there's even a wind machine in the percussion section to give you the effect of wind whistling by as they whoosh up and down through the clouds. Now, why couldn't this music be describing the flight of a jet plane? Or a satellite whistling around in its orbit? Or maybe some old giant snoring like the prisoners in the jail going, could be. Well, now let's make believe it is about some old giant snoring and see how the music fits. exciting music? No matter what it's about, it's still exciting. Because the music is exciting and for no other reason. Now, that's enough talk about music that tells stories. Let's take a big step now toward finding out the answer to our first question, what does music mean, by listening to some music that doesn't try to tell a story but only tries to paint a picture in a general sort of way or to describe an atmosphere, the look of something, the feel of something, like a night in the woods, or an old haunted house, or a sunrise. Now we're getting closer to real musical meaning, because we don't have a story to worry about while we're listening. You see, all we have to think about is the general idea, and that's easier, so we can concentrate more on the music and enjoy it more. Now, for instance, take Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. Here's a wonderful piece full of charming tunes and marvelous rhythms, driving, peaceful, happy, all kinds of things. But in Beethoven's mind, this symphony was somehow tied up with the idea of the countryside. Farmers, brooks, shepherds, birds. And so he called it the pastoral symphony. As you know, pastoral means anything to do with the country. Uh, at the beginning of the first movement, he wrote the words, awakening of cheerful feelings on arriving in the country. And the music goes like this. Sounds happy, cheerful, and pretty, all right. But these feelings, after all, could be happy for any other reason, too. Supposing Beethoven had written the words, happy feelings because my uncle left me a million dollars, or happy feelings because my bellyache went away. He could still have written this happy music and it would have been just as good and just as happy. Well, now let's try something. Let's change the title of this piece 
and call it happy feelings because my bellyache went away, let's say. And let's listen to it with that in mind and see if it sounds any different. same happy music, whether it's about your bellyache or a trip to the country. Now, the second movement, Beethoven calls By the Brook. And in this movement, he is trying to describe or imitate or suggest the motion of water in the brook. But supposing we call this asleep in a hammock and that this motion we're describing gently rocking back and forth in a hammock instead of the water. Let's see how the music would sound then. it doesn't change a thing, does it? Whether it's about water or swinging in a hammock, it's the same lovely music. Now, one of the best pieces that paint pictures is by a Russian composer called Mussorgsky. And he wrote a piece named Pictures at an Exhibition. What Mussorgsky did was to take a lot of pictures hanging on a wall in a museum and write music that he thought could describe them. In other words, to try and do with notes what a painter does with paint. Now, of course, all of us know that notes can't do what paint can do. You can't draw your nose with F sharps, and you can't draw a building or paint a sunset with notes. But you can sort of try to do it. Anyway, here's one of those pictures he tried to do it with. It shows children playing in a park. And what Mussorgsky did to make it sound like children playing was to imitate the way children talk when they play games, almost like singing, you know, when, when you go in a game, Ollie, Ollie, and free, Ollie, Ollie, and free, there's a kind of tune you're singing. Or when kids are taunting each other, making fun of each other when they play, and they go, nya, 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 nya. Uh, Busorgsky took this nya, 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 and watch how he uses it.
nyah, 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 nyah. You see how he uses this? Almost to paint children with notes. Then there's another picture Mussorgsky painted with notes of many little chickens not yet out of their eggshells who do a dance. I'll listen to how he describes chickens in notes, the way he imitates their pecking and squawking. <laughs> And then, and then the final picture, the last one of the series, where he paints a big gate in the Russian city of Kiev, a tremendous stone structure. And you can see what Mussorgsky had in his mind when you hear these great big strong chords like pillars holding up those tons of stone. Listen. made you think of a big gate, didn't it? Did it? Didn't it? Okay. But only because I told you beforehand to think of a big gate. If I had told you beforehand to think about the Mississippi River flowing majestically down the middle of America, you would have had that in your mind when you heard these big chords. So again, there's the old answer. The picture that goes with music goes with it only because the composer says so but it's not really a part of the music. It's extra. Now we're going to take another giant step toward finding out our answer to what music means. And this is a really big step. We're getting closer now to the answer. Because now we're going to forget all about those pieces that try to tell stories or paint pictures. We've had enough of that. And we're going to listen to music that describes emotions, feelings, like pain, happiness, loneliness, anger, love. I guess most music is like that. And the better it is, the more it will make you feel those emotions that the composer felt when he was writing. Tchaikovsky was a composer who always tried to do this, who always tried to have his music mean something 
easily recognized as emotional. Uh, take this part of his fourth symphony, for instance. <laughs> the best way to describe that would be by saying that it has the feeling of wanting something very badly that you can't have. Did you ever feel that you wanted something more than anything else in the world and you said so and they said no you can't have it and you said again I want it and again they said no and again you said louder and more excited I want it and again louder I want it until it seemed that something would break in your head and there's nothing left to do but cry. Well, that's like this music. Listen. I want it. 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 Finally, something breaks in your head and you cry. Now listen to the orchestra play it and see if you don't feel something like those emotions. emotional stuff, isn't it? Well, now, sometimes Tchaikovsky uses the same tune to describe two different emotions. For instance, at the beginning of his fifth symphony, <coughs> he writes this tune, which sounds sad and gloomy and depressed. But at the end of the symphony, in the last movement, he changes a few notes, what musicians call changing from minor to major. Some of you will know what that means. And it all comes out joyful and triumphant, like someone who has just made a touchdown and is the hero of the football game. <coughs>
you feel triumphant? And didn't, didn't that make you feel like the winner at least of a football game, maybe of a presidential election? Now we can really understand what the meaning of music is. It's the way it makes you feel when you hear it. Finally, we've taken that last giant step, and we're there. We know what music means now. And we don't have to know a lot of stuff about sharps and flats and chords and all that business in order to understand music. If it tells us something, not a story or a picture, but a feeling, if it makes us change inside and have all those different good feelings that music can make you have, then you're understanding it. And that's all there is to it. Because those feelings aren't like the stories and the pictures we talked about before. They're not extra. They're not outside the music. They belong to the music. They're what music is about. And the most wonderful thing of all is that there's no limit to the different kinds of feelings music can make you have. And some of those feelings are so special and so deep that they can't even be described in words. You see, we can't always name the things we feel. Sometimes we can. We can say we feel joy, pleasure, peacefulness, whatever, love, hate. But every once in a while, we have feelings that are so deep and so special that we have no words for them. And that's where music is so marvelous, because music names them for us only in notes instead of in words. It's all in the way music moves. You must never forget that music is movement, always going somewhere, shifting and changing and flowing from one note to another. And that movement can tell us more about the way we feel than a million words can. Uh, here we're going to play you a tiny little piece by a modern composer named Weber, who writes music that's so special in its sound and in its meaning that a lot of people don't understand it at all and just call it crazy modern music. But I know that very often young people can understand this kind of music better than older people. So I'd like to take a chance and play it for you, crazy as it is, and see what you think of it. Pretty special stuff, isn't it? You see, if you even sneeze or cough, you're liable to miss it. It's so delicate and so deep inside that you mustn't even breathe while it's going on. What did you think of it? Did you think it was ugly? It was funny? Think it was pretty? Did, you, did it make you have feelings? Well, that's wonderful because, you see, that's just the wonder of music, that it can make you have, different people have different kinds of feelings. For instance, if I play a note on the piano, just one note, and I hold it a long time, that has no meaning at all, has it? But let's say I play the note, and then I move to another note. Right away, there's a meaning, a meaning we can't name, a sort of stretch, a pulling, a pushing, something like that, but it's there. And the meaning is in the way those two notes move and it makes something happen inside of you. If I move from that first note to another note, like this, the meaning changes. Something else happens inside of you. The stretch is bigger somehow and stronger. Now this note, for instance, means one thing with this chord under it. And it makes you feel a certain way. And it means something completely different with this chord under it. And it makes you feel another way. 
then with this chord under it, it means something else. Or with this chord. And each way, each different chord makes you feel a different way. Now, what about these notes? Do you know what these notes are? What's that? Right, okay. Well, now they mean something exciting and spooky is going to happen, like dragnet. But if I take the same notes and just play them in a different way, they'll mean something else. Silly, it's just light and silly. And they're the same notes. So you see, the meaning of music is in music. It's in the melodies and the rhythms and the harmonies and the way it's orchestrated. And most important of all, in the way it develops itself. But that's a whole other program. We'll talk about that some other time. Right now, all you have to know is that music has its own meanings right there for you to find inside the music itself. And you don't need any stories or any pictures to tell you what it is. If you like music at all, you'll find out the meanings for yourselves just by listening to it. So now I want you to listen to a short piece without any explanation from anybody. I'm not going to tell you anything about it except the name of it and who wrote it. And you just all sit back and relax and enjoy it and listen to the notes and feel them move around, jumping and hopping and bumping and flashing and sliding and whatever they do, and just enjoy that without a whole lot of fuss about stories and pictures and all that business. Now, the piece we're going to play for you is by Ravel, and it's called La Valse. I think you'll like it because it's fun to listen to, and not for any other reason, not because it's about anything. It's just good, exciting music. 